thanks a lot, everyone, uh, for joining us today on this interesting webinar. Um, we really appreciate all of the participations from all across different agencies and different partners and look forward to this very interesting discussion today on aviation security with a focus on Iraq. Um, my name is Yazan Mushah and I'll be your moderator for today. I look forward to engage with you today on this discussion. Um, we're gonna start by taking an overview about what we're gonna be covering uh, throughout the webinar at large. And one of the things that we look forward to discussing today is exploring aviation security origins. Where did it all start? How did we get here? And what's the future of that entire process? Then we're gonna also explore what are some of the international enablers globally that contributed to um, the stability of aviation security, and then focus on an excellent example from Iraq that highlights how commitment towards aviation security standards and alignment with those and building upon those can establish a uniform approach toward aviation security at large. And of course, we'll allow room for questions and answers at the end of the webinar to engage with the audience and you know, inform our approach as we go. We're gonna start by giving a brief introduction uh, on our speakers today and John, uh, I'll give it to you. Thank you, Yasan, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is John Canley. I'm an aviation security professional manager and have been working with CRDF on uh, a range of projects, including this uh, most recent aviation security uh, engagement. Uh, I've been in the region for a number of years, since 2005, and spent some considerable time on projects um, in Iraq, as well as projects around transportation and critical infrastructure across the region. Thanks, Yazan. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, Sir Ali. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon you. Engineer Ali Hussain and Nasser uh, from ICA, Iraqi Civil Aviation Authority. I'm responsible for monitoring the equality of Iraqi aviation. I have over 10 years of experience working in aviation. I'm also a security trainer and inspector and aviation security coordinator working with ECAO. Worked with the TS and other uh, leading institutions in this field. Thank you. Again, for those who joined us just now, my name is Izan Shah and I'm a senior project lead at CRDF Global. During my time at the organization, I have managed multiple aviation security projects tackling the civility and promulgation of aviation security standards uh, regionally. Um, we're gonna start by discussing the major aspect that we wanted to focus on for today's webinar, and that is aviation security origins. Now, if we look back almost hundred years ago, we'll find a totally different goal. We'll find a totally different landscape. You know, countries had different, a totally different perspective when it comes to perceiving border security because we only had two transportation methods. We had the railways, we had the transportation by early, I would say vehicles, and also as well as ships. So in order for you to transport commodities or individuals from one country to the other, the only methods that were available were ships, trains, and their likes. And that traditional type of, of, of transportation methods also implicated uh, traditional threats that come along with it. So when it comes to borders, the threats that would normally come is the smuggling of commodities and, 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 and items across the globe. And, and the smuggling was not only, you know, for the purpose of, for example, smuggling drugs or smuggling, you know, um, dangerous items, but it was also smuggling normal commodities for the purpose of just, you know, moving around the government regulations that were in place and, you know, making that profit out of these uh, operations. And at the same time, one of the most common themes and challenges that were also happening during that era was human trafficking. And, and as we know, the immigration protocols and procedures were not as advanced as we are today. So it was way easier for you know, individual crossings and penetration of 
borders uh, to happen across, across the globe. And also given the historic and, and political landscape back then, one of the most prominent ways of trafficking was of course the weapons and arms trafficking that, that's still a, a, a problem until our time. But you know, as soon as we got into aviation security, I think that all. Uh, uh, as soon as we got sorry to air travel, I think that all changed. You know, with air travel, every it, it took the world by storm. You know, our globe was no longer the same. People were not requiring days or even weeks, sometimes months, to move from one location to the other. You could easily arrive at a destination in a matter of a few hours, and that has created, of course a lot of facilitations, a lot of um, made, made the quality of our lives easier, but at the same time, it brought its own set of challenges. And I think with that, you know, these challenges grew more unpredictable uh, as the threats that come through the borders become, become, became more unpredictable because we were in the past only looking at land ports like border gates, um, seaports, but now we have a new concept that the world is getting used to, and that is airports. So as soon as we had, had that, these airports established, individuals traveling to these airports started to create unconventional methods to penetrate the security systems of these airports. And so we had attacks that were unpredictable. The intentions behind the attacks changed. So if it was for monetary gain, for economic gain, or for simply a, a political agenda, it also started to become beyond a regional or local agenda to impact regions, uh, national, you know, uh, politics across countries and also nationally. And at the same time, we started to see a trend and a change in behavior where people started to use aviation threats as a mean to affect and influence mass media. So you would see accidents and you would see incidents and attacks that are intentional and target to bring the media attention to a specific case or to a specific um, I would say, um, issue across the globe. So that's, if, if we look at that from a higher perspective, I think that provides us with a paradigm shift in the way we looked at security. The word was shaken and took by, taken by storm by, by how aviation security, uh, aviation at large, uh, changed the way we operate. Uh, I don't know, John and, and uh, Ali, if you want to add anything uh, to this. Yeah, thanks, Yazan. Certainly the, the impact of media has certainly driven the international terrorism, I guess, um, impact almost their return on investment. And it's kind of like a self-sustainable model almost. Without the media, would there be as much terrorism and vice versa, certainly uh, in, in, in recent global events. Um, but it's interesting to note here that the freedom, the enabling of the, the world's population to make air travel more accessible has brought in a new range of threats over time that we thought perhaps weren't possible. Um, but certainly aviation security has stayed on the forefront uh, across most of the different types of security in terms of being able to identify threats and then respond to them. Thanks, Yazan. Thanks a lot, John. Sir Ali, do you have anything to add to this? Yes, please. Aviation security is an important part and it's an integral part of international aviation. It's about control. It's about studying all ideas that may lead to threats threatening security and safety of travelers. So aviation security is the most important part, in my opinion, for the safety of travelers. So studying such an issue is important. Studying terrorists, their approaches is also very important to overcome challenges that come from the side. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, you know, building off this topic, we're going to move to the next slide um, that addresses um, the development and growth of aviation security. And uh, John, I'm going to give you the floor here to elaborate a bit more. So thanks, Yazan. And, and, and this slide is quite interesting because across the top, we have a timeline of, of key milestones. 
and across the bottom we have some indicators of some bias some photos or images on some of the developments. So if we look at the bottom left of the slide, we will see that the customer experience in the early days of the 60s and 70s around aviation was all about the customer experience and having this wonderful, I guess, golden age of aviation where you know, boarding a, an aeroplane and, and disembarking was as routine as, as using a bus or a train with very little thought of passing through security layers in an airport prior to boarding or even security layers of the aircraft itself. However, in response to some of the threats that have evolved over time, which we'll discuss more in detail later, aviation security pr protocols have evolved. And, and the middle photo there is an early response with the introduction of walkthrough metal detectors. And then of course, on the right-hand side, we. Uh, then looked at x-ray screening of baggage. Now, interestingly enough, for many, many years, this was considered sufficient for aviation security. However, driven by the response to global events under the guidance of the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO, there was the introduction and updates to standards and regulatory practices. So looking at the top half of that slide, and we look around the key milestones, um, of interesting note is the drafting of the Chicago Convention in 1944 and then adoption in 1947. Um, and that was really the world coming together via the UN and looking at how do we regulate a range of standards and regulatory practices for aviation. And in 1975, you'll see there in green, um, annex 17 as a, an annex to the Chicago um, Convention was introduced. And this was relating to the standards and regulatory practices aimed to prevent and suppress all acts of unlawful interference against civil aviation throughout the world. So this was quite a very important document and, and today it remains as one of the key aviation security documents globally. And then on the far right in yellow, we have in 2001, the game changed with the 9-11 and which we'll delve into deeper later, but it changed the way that we view modern aviation and transportation security measures across the globe. So these are some of the key milestones that we'll probably touch on a bit later on today. Next slide, please. So here we have nine incidents which highlight both historical and current threats that aviation faces today. So in the top left-hand corner, we have the Dawson's Field incident from the 70s in which three aircraft were hijacked and diverted to a desert airstrip in Jordan. Following the evacuations of the aircraft, the terrorists used explosives to destroy the empty planes in full view of the assembled media. One of their key objectives, which they achieved, was getting their message out to the world. Um, following this incident, uh, walk through metal detectors were trialed, although they weren't operationally applied to some consistency across the world for some many years. The next incident we have is Flight 45, which was scheduled to fly from Guana uh, to, to Cuba via Trinidad, Tobago, and then in Jamaica. Along this journey, uh, the terrorists allegedly departed the plane in Barbados. And then between Barbados and Jamaica in October 76, the uh, onboard bomb, the onboard IED exploded inside check baggage um, and it destroyed the aircraft. It was one of the very first incidents where we looked at check baggage versus uh, the manifest of the passengers. Now, this has great similarities to the third one, the middle one on the top row, Pan Am 103. Um, in which an onboard explosion from a bomb inside check baggage destroyed the 747 over the Scottish town of Lockerbie, resulting in 270 fatalities. So the first incident was, you know, we're looking in, in Barbados, um, you know, between Barbados and Jamaica over the sea. Uh, it didn't have that much of a global impact. It had some, 
but certainly when you have a US carrier uh, destroyed by an onboard explosion over the United Kingdom, now we have the world's attention. And so to attempt to sort of prevent a repeat of such a devastating event, we looked at in the aviation security world, the discrepancies between uh, do we allow baggage to go on, on board a plane if the passenger is not on board the plane. And this was one of the first uh, um, looks at baggage reconciliation, which was used to prevent such a, a, a reoccurring um, a sort of attack. We move forward to the right one box. We look at the infamous 2001 9-11 attack. With the coordinated hijackings of four aircraft and eventually three of these aircraft flying into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon building. Now, as a result of this, aviation security measures globally were significantly increased in an unprecedented and integrated approach. So interestingly enough, the minimum standards and regulatory practices of the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, were no longer sufficient. These minimum standards were no longer good enough for not only the US, but many other countries who introduced additional security layers as well as well-coordinated integration with immigration, customs, intelligence, and other aviation activities. Security was no longer just in a silo. Security had to be coordinated and integrated. And in the modern age of, you know, we're looking at the last 10 years, aviation security has become a driving factor for both airport and aviation activities surpassing the ease of commercial interest or perhaps the, the friendly experience of just turning up half an hour before the flight and getting on board. And then if we look at the bottom row here, we have some more recent events. Um, in 2006, when we look at uh, how liquid explosives um, were derived and, and there was a, an alleged terrorist plot to detonate multiple um, bombs on multiple commercial aircraft and that changed how we were allowed to carry on board liquids, aerosols and gels, often referred to as LAGs, L-A-G. Then in 2009, we had an, the underpants bomber where a male traveler en route from Ghana to Amsterdam, and then he boarded a, a flight to, uh, to Detroit on Northwest Airlines Flight 253. During that flight, he attempted to ignite the bomb sewn into his underwear but as it, it ignited and caused a, a short, a small fire, the flames were noticed by a fellow traveler, which was really interesting, who intervened and subdued him whilst the flight attendants uh, used fire extinguishers to douse the flames. So now, interesting enough, we've got a new threat, but actually, hey, we've got a great response. We're now getting travelers who are very aware of what's going on around them and are happy to get involved. Now, once again, a new threat, we have a new countermeasure. So body uh, scanners were introduced uh, in many airports to reveal what hidden threats or hidden substances such as bombs may be concealed under the clothing of travelers. Now this has to be balanced off with the privacy concerns, but we're seeing this pattern of the travelers are wanting to see noticeable security as a overt and preventative measure. And then of course, in 2015 and 16, old threats came back, threats that we thought we had dealt with. So the downing of Metrojet uh, 9268 after taking off on Shamal Sheikh, by the detonation of an onboard IED. This is an old threat that's just re-emerged. Um, and then we have the Egypt Air domestic flight, uh, 181, where a hijacking with a, a passenger claiming to wear a suicide vest, a suicide bomb. Um, now this was, flight was diverted to Cyprus and the hijacker eventually surrendered to government authority. So you could almost say this 2016 event, does that really upset everything? Well, yes, because if you think about all of the passengers, all of the connecting flights, all of the airports, the disruption to aviation has just grown exponentially. And we have two incidents in the same, let's call it country of Egypt, 
where now we've got a lot of concern from, from, from travellers and tourism and, and other member states. And a number of countries after the 2015 um, uh, bombing of the Metro jet stopped flying to Egypt. And it was devastating to the tourism industry. So, you know, one little event like that, which may appear to have very small impact, actually can have a ripple effect, which sort of magnifies. So these two uh, e events in 2015 and 16, they remind us that old threats are not replaced by new threats, but rather new threats add a layer of concern to existing threats. And in the bottom right-hand corner of, of, of the slide, we have the Im an, an image from the 2016 Brussels attack. Now that was interesting because it affected not only the international airport, but a central railway station in Brussels. Now this had a huge ripple effect globally that is perhaps not well known, but it, 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 it resulted in the closure of several borders in Europe for a very short period of time and transport hate, transportation hubs across the world. China, Denmark, Greece, Japan, the Philippines, and the UK and the US, just to name a few, were some of the countries that were affected by that event. So truly, any aviation security incident has a global impact. And this is something that is mindful with the International Civil Aviation Organization and the member states is that we have to all work together to look after the world, not just our own uh, uh, small location. And next slide, please. And, and yeah, before before we kind of move to the next slide, what I what this really highlights, John and Sir Ali, I think, is that these threats kept developing and and kept being brought in unconventional ways. And as we explore, we, we realize that these threat, you know, to a greater degree shaped the security measures we have nowadays. And at the same time, it also highlights that even if we have bridged that gap and addressed that issue, and, you know, we now have a protocol that tracks that specific threat, that does not mean that the problem is solved. And that highlights, as you mentioned in the examples, especially in the 2015 and 2016 incidents, that this requires a thorough review and analysis. And it does not mean that I've created that standard or I've created that measure that I'm, uh, that I'm covering. And Mr. Ali, I'm also interested to your take on this and how you view this uh, you know, region. Now, now I'm saying this and I'm not talking to you. Yes, Mr. Yezen, I totally agree with Mr. John on the threats of terrorism and dangers of terrorism in the world. Terrorism looks at the entire world, not at certain regions or countries. They do not think of anything, of anything but destruction. So the world is connected, like Mr. John said, it's fully connected. All procedures are in one country, may be useful to other countries. We have certain security gaps. All countries should work together to bridge the gaps. If tourism exists in one country, it does not mean that it, it, it cannot move to other countries. The world is connected, like I said, and it's connected through aviation and aviation security. So we need to consider security procedures. We need to study them and restudy them on regular basis. We also need, need to think like terrorists to have their imagination in order to know how, how to handle obstacles that come from them. Thank you. Sometimes in order for you to know the gaps, within your system, you need to look at it from the lens of the perpetrator or from the lens of the malicious actor. And I think that's a very good point that highlights that we need to always explore also uncon unconventional ways on how we analyze and review our own processes. And, you know, John and, and Ali, I think 
with, with your insights that you've discussed on this slide, this, this leads us to the question then, where do we go if, if these individual incidents keep happening? How does the world have a uniform approach towards those? And I think that'll be answered in the next few slides that we'll be discussing as well. So thanks, Yosan. So here we have a slide that gives an image of two documents. So the document in blue is Annex 17, and the document with the red is the Aviation Security Manual, also known as, as document 8973. So these are the most critical aviation security documents that we work with. They are produced by the International Civil Aviation Organization, and they issue, maintain, and regularly update these documents, which are part of their standards and regulatory practices, often referred to as, 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 as SARPs, S-A-R-P-S. So Annex 17 is the standard for member states to apply and where aviation security manual is a regulatory practice. So the, the terminology in Annex 17 is going to be shall. The member states shall do this. And the aviation security manual will often have slightly different language as the world catches up before it becomes a standard. Um, what's very interesting about this, and this is something that we'll touch upon in the, when we talk about the, international, the Iraq Civil Aviation Authority and the, the case study, is that member states are required as a signatory to the Chicago Convention to adopt all of the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization documents, all the standards and all the guidelines um, with references in their national legislation to ensure that each member state has both similar and effective legislation and regulations that can be implemented and recognized by other member states. So for example, if a hijacking occurs in one country and is flown to another country, do both countries have aviation security legislation that deals with the minimum requirements requested by uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization? Will both countries apply similar uh, penalties for breaking legislation? So we're looking at having a standard and regulatory practice across the world where member states have confidence in dealing with each other. Now, these are only minimum standards. So many of you will recognize when you're flying to certain countries under certain conditions, you may have additional measures. You may be at one airport that's flying to the US and you've been through all the layers of security. And then as you get to the plane, there's an additional layer. Perhaps they're checking documentation, perhaps it's an x-ray screening, perhaps it's a range of different security measures. So this is important that all of the countries adopt both Annex 17 and Doc Document 8973, um, as well as all the other annexes and all the other documents that are issued by um, ICAO because they have overlapping and interdependent activities. Facilitation, which talks about, for example, the machine readable um, uh, 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 fonts on the bottom of your passports. That's really important, not only for security and, and validating this person really is who they say they are in the passport, but it also has linkage to making it smooth and easy to process passengers and baggage and flight data and a whole range of information. So these standards and regulatory practices are really important because they're the glue that holds everything together. Um, so uh, back to you, Yazan. Thank you a lot, John. And I think, you know, looking at the standards and, and looking at how, how that is all minded, I think the ICAO serves that integrator as that organization that is vested with the opportunity to provide the globe with a single body of knowledge, with a baseline of understanding 
where do we start and how do we build it from there? And you know, when we discuss the accidents and how these accidents were happening individually and they're having that ripple effect, the ICAO is the antidote to that, where, whereby it provides the globe with that umbrella where here's what you can do globally to act as a single organism and respond to these threats. Now, as long as you're responding to these threats individually, it's going to be more like a contagion. It's going to be spreading from one country to the other. And I think I would be also very interested to hear from Mr. Ali on his views regionally specifically on, on the ICAO and the role it provides for the region and, and, and globally at large. Now, say this, and I agree totally with you, and I agree with John, too. Uh, yes, Mr. Yezan, I agree totally with you, and I agree with John, too. I second your opinions. Since uh, this uh, document for the experts is considered uh, um, a treasure of information, as a matter of fact, as John expressed already, that this is the minimal limit or the minimal amount of uh, knowledge that you or that one country may uh, take in order to maintain its safety and security. Therefore, all countries should issue local instructions that are in compliance with um, those uh, instructions issued by the ICAO. So those instructions and regulations within a country are considered uh, like uh, procedures. Uh, they are considered the key for the safety and security for such countries. All countries are supposed uh, to participate uh, with the proper parts with the re rest of the cooperating countries in terms uh, of aviation. So those procedures in the uh, X country would be in compliance uh, with the um, security, its local security, and in compliance with uh, its legal measures and um, the security measures uh, for the other security measures uh, like uh, um, the um, uh, GID or the, the military, etc. Um, it's just like the whole um, security, uh, security system for the country. I'm oh, sorry. And the standards are only a starting point, and that countries have latitude to build upon those. Sorry, Yazan. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Yazan. Those uh, documents, those instruments are basic, uh, they are essential. And um, then uh, the local ones should be built uh, and also should be committed to in the respective countries. And all uh, security agencies in X country should be committed to those uh, programs and the national program for the aviation security. And after that, Per airport, there should be a security program for that uh, airport. The national program binds or draws the public uh, policy for that country in compliance with the security measures uh, for the uh, ICAO and also the uh, respective airport security program in X country, since uh, the countries do not have only one um, airport. So there is one, two, three airport per city or even more in. Uh, that respective country. That's uh, the security and the um, airport uh, security program should be in compliance with the um, strategy in the country. And thus it is a comprehensive integral uh, security program for the protection of aviation with all of its parts. So those instructions and the security programs should be in compliance as already mentioned by Mr. John and should be in compliance with the international instruments. But at the same time, we should be looking at the facilitations uh, for the um, uh, travelers uh, or the passengers. It is not uh, the purpose to uh, complicate things yet for their protection and then their arrival from their home country to the country that they are heading to. Thank you. Hey, John, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yes, and yes. Yeah, I, I was just asking, you wanted to add anything uh, in addition to what Mr. Ali discussed? Uh, no, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Excellent, and I see the in the comments section, so if you have any questions, please send those and we'll make sure that we try to 
answer as much of those by the end of the webinar as well. Um, moving on to the next slide. Go ahead, John. Uh, thanks, Yazan. So we've sort of touched upon the importance of standards and regulatory practices and supporting these uh, events and activities facilitated by the International Civil Aviation Organization. And they extend to webinars, conferences, training and regional events. And a lot of this is about building trust and capacity, capacity uh, in relation to national member states, as well as building that trust and liaison between member states. Um, interestingly enough, to ensure confidence building by other member states, both the International Civil Aviation Organization and the US government's Federal Aviation Administration apply a, an audit system, often referred to as critical elements. The uh, critical elements um, cover eight topics, and for both the uh, ICAO and uh, the FAA, uh, under the International Aviation Safety Audit, these eight critical elements include primary aviation legislation. Does a member state have specific aviation security legislation, which would not only provide guidance, but also provide penalties. So for example, a hijacker lands in a country is this against the law? Is it covered by legislation? Is there a penalty to be applied? Then supporting legislation, we have critical element number two being specific operating regulations. Critical element three talks about civil aviation system and safety oversight functions. Four is around personnel qualifications and training. Critical element five is around technical guidance tools and provision of safety critical information. So here we can see how security is really reaching out beyond just the silo of security, but extending into the other aviation uh, 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 business units, shall we say. Critical element six is around licensing, certification, authorization and approval obligations. What are we required to do? How are we required to do it as a regulator? Um, and that's an interesting element for many countries is that their civil aviation organization um, has the hat of regulator and perhaps operator in some instances if, the, if there's a limited number of airports. And so this critical element is really looking at regulation obligations. Then of course we have critical uh, element seven, which is around surveillance obligations. And that's not, not just security, but that extends into all the other aspects. Are we liaising with uh, airlines, airports? Uh, are we liaising with um, service providers, uh, manifests? And then of course, critical element number eight is that resolution of safety concerns. So in if or when there is some sort of incident or emergency, how are we resolving it? Are we resolving it to the minimum standard? Now, with any audit, it's about minimum standards. And that's sort of quite interesting in that this is very much a, a carrot and a stick approach where the International Civil Aviation Organization certainly proactively engages all of the member states to very clearly and transparently spell out, advise, what these eight critical elements require uh, as a incentivization for the member states to comply with it. The Federal uh, uh, Aviation Administration through their International Aviation Safety Audit has a slightly different track in terms of they have a list and you're a category one or a category two. Category one, you can fly direct to the US. Uh, category two is uh, we'd like you to fly direct to the US, but there's some things you need to look at. And then if you don't perform as a category two country, you drop off. Um, so they have a very different approach, but the eight critical elements cover predominantly the same eight elements. And, and this is really all about the world's aviation security professionals coming together. And it's a very small world um, in terms of who knows who and, and understanding how different countries work together. And this is these standards and regulatory practices, Annex 17 and 
document 8973 are absolutely critical to for a country to understand and apply to be able to facilitate international trade which ultimately helps their everything from economics to society to global trade there's so much riding on annex 17 and the application of document 8973 and back to you Yazan. thank you uh, thanks a lot uh john moving on to the next slide and we're gonna get a national and a regional perspective uh, from the MENA, specifically from Iraq. And in today's discussion, we'll highlight uh, the, the, the regional efforts that are happening you know, globally and specifically in Iraq to achieve that alignment, promulgate that knowledge regionally and ensure that all countries, no matter where, where you are in the globe, are responsible towards aviation security. And, and one of our partners that we're very happy to work with and have worked with in the past which is the International Civil Aviation Authority in Iraq. And we have, of course, Mr. Ali as the representative of that agency to kind of provide us with a walkthrough on ICA at large, its, its history and, and start to drill a bit more on the recent Iraqi effort in collaboration with the Department of State and the Express program towards leveraging aviation security in the country. Mr. Ali, I give it back to you. Uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Yezan. So, the civil aviation in Iraq uh, has uh, started in the 30s of the previous century. Uh, so, there were, since uh, the uh, state of Iraq was established in 1921, there was the first uh, civil aviation, or let's say the first uh, civil airport in uh, Iraq was in 1933. As a matter of fact, it was uh, amongst the first three airports uh, throughout the world in terms uh, um, of the capacity, preparedness, equipment, etc. So this is a part of the avi civil aviation uh, history in Iraq. And in 1974, um, um, the uh, who implemented aviation security legislation as a signatory to the ICAO, and uh, that was uh, issued in 1947, as I said. And uh, it regulates, amongst uh, the other regulations and instructions uh, for the aviation um, and in all aspects in Iraq. Still, it is amongst uh, the main uh, laws and regulations, um, uh, they are still effective and in force up until now. Since this law was uh, phrased uh, robustly. And uh, then in 1996, uh, um, the uh, civil aviation, the Iraqi civil aviation joined the Arab civil aviation organization. And then after 2003, uh, the US military took responsibility for uh, aviation security operations so during 2011 and 2017. And the government of Iraq recently addressing uh, aviation security requirements uh, via the Iraqi Civil Aviation Authority by uh, through an agreement with the Department of State. Uh, amongst these aspects, it was this cooperation with uh, the CRDF to uh, elevate or to um, enhance uh, certain um, security measures in Iraq and the help in implementation is in the mic is yours. You know, what we have to highlight here is that this is a long process and this is a prolonged process that has been going on for a while and it's, it did not happen overnight. And, and it highlights the tremendous efforts that the Iraqi government supported by the Department of State and the Express, uh, Express uh, program in, in promulgating and in leveraging these uh, needs. Um, moving on to the next slide, I think we're gonna provide, John, if you could do that uh, quickly to highlight what was the, um, you know, the emphasis and the focus of that project and what are the aspects that it focused on? Let me unmute myself, thank you. Thanks, Jaza. So this was a very interesting project because we had the US government who funded an initiative to uh, enhance aviation security 
uh, not just for Iraq, but for the region and, and, and for the globe. And what we were looking at doing was assisting with an update to the National Civil Aviation Security Plan, which is the, the strategy document to enable updated legislation and regulation and, and operations. Um, so there was great engagement with the government of Iraq leadership through the Iraqi Civil Aviation um, Authority and meeting people like um, Ali and many of his colleagues and all working together in a very collaborative and participation uh, approach to look at how we could update an existing document in line with the uh, updated Annex 17 and updated Document 8973, the Aviation Security Manual, and look at making the National Civil Aviation Security Plan um, fit for purpose, making it modern, making it looking at all of the, the elements that we need to, to, to make a civil aviation, both in Iraq, flying over Iraq and regionally safer. So the sort of some of the uh, activities we took was around drafting an updated and completely revised National Civil Aviation Security Plan. We undertook a very comprehensive review of documentation and legislation and, and organizational capability and, and a whole range of, of, of issues that we had there. We, along this, this journey, we developed a tailored capability maturity model. And for those who've ever done work with capability maturity models, um, we applied a tailored version, uh, very complex behind the scenes around matrices and, and, and definitions and so forth. And then once we agreed upon this capability maturity model, we applied an as is assessment. So we took Iraq's National Civil Aviation Security Plan and we mapped that against the capability maturity model. And we came out with a series of, uh, I guess, assessments uh, based upon the criteria we had agreed upon per hand. Um, and we had determined where did we think Iraq sat against this capability maturity model. Then uh, with sort of overlapping activities, we reached out to trusted personnel around the world in different uh, countries and organizations. And we did a, a benchmarking uh, of three other countries, National Civil Aviation Security Plan, and map that against the model to then be able to sort of compare and contrast where does Iraq sit compared to other countries around the world. And, and then finally, without just relying upon that and saying, you know, where are we sitting? We then looked at a roadmap. And then we said, based upon all the information we have to date, where do we want Iraq to be and how to get there and when and what's required? What are those dependencies? So, you know, one of the countries was, you know, was, was you know, very mature in terms of a, a model and was right up there. Did Iraq need to replicate then? No. And there was one country that happened to be far below. Did... Iraq need to replicate that country? No, Iraq is Iraq. And Iraq is, has some very common issues that the rest of the world have around funding and around politics and all the things that we, we, we have in our own home countries. But Iraq has some very uniqueness that we needed to, to look at with the roadmap and then together look at how can we overcome those challenges? How can we work together to achieve some of these, I guess, unique aims and objectives that, that we are seeking. So that roadmap was the culmination of several months work where we all collaborated, lots of documents to review, lots of online meetings to have. Um, and that roadmap was there to certainly provide um, guidance to funders and, 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 and key stakeholders around what do we think are the next steps? Where does Iraq need support and, and guidance in, in, in the future? So that's kind of, uh, a summary overview of of this this case study that we applied and uh, happily when it gets time for questions and answers um, hopefully have more discussion about it yes sir. perfect thanks a lot john and and you know that that leads us to you know for people who are wondering well that's a substantial amount of effort you know and what were the 
enablers towards that success? How did we come about that solution? And I think the main triangle, the, the triangle of that success really came through the stakeholder engagement, engaging with Mr. Ali and with the colleagues at ICA and the government of Iraq at large, and having these consistent and regular conversations to establish a shared understanding of where we are and where we need to be, and then agreeing on an action plan to improve and optimize these, these, these standards and, and, and cement them further. And I think one of the other uh, things that we really appreciated about working with Mr. Ali and, and ICA at large is the amount of open communication and access that we had to our experts, to our team in, in communicating with Mr. Ali to talk about issues and challenges and how we address them objectively to make sure that they bring the intended impact. And most importantly is that this is only the cornerstone and this is only the beginning of the work that is yet to come to position Iraq as one of the regional champions in aviation security and, and, and so, that, so that it becomes an, a comparable example to neighboring countries as well. And, and you know, last but not least, of course, we also wanted to hear from Mr. Ali and Mr. Ali, if you could speak to this on what did ICAA get in, in Iraq at large get from this? What, what's the impact of that project and what's the future looking like you know, now that this project has been delivered? Thank you, Mr. Yazan. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a cooperation, close cooperation with the ICA in terms of uh, developing the security uh, with the um, Iraqi uh, Civil Aviation Authority and they did DOS this since 2013. And thus we have been visited by um, a, a big group of uh, the, uh, a big delegates from uh, the DOS and through CRDF uh, and also they have visited uh, Baghdad Airport, Erbin Baghdad Airport, and Basra Airport. Those are the three major airports in Iraq. At the same time, there were condensed meetings um, between uh, the DOS and the security experts uh, uh, from uh, the US, in addition to the representatives from the ICAA and other the representatives from the airport. Uh, what, uh, there were many recommendations uh, uh, as uh, outcomes of those meetings. Uh, among those recommendations is to enhance uh, and uh, check all the security measures implemented at all uh, uh, Iraqi airports. And then uh, there were points identifying uh, that uh, they may be assisting Iraq in implementing those uh, improvements. Among those points, um, were to develop uh, core rules and regulations for the aviation security in Iraq, which is the uh, national security, national avi uh, Iraqi national aviation security. And after all of those recommendations, we have cooperated with them. And then uh, with the participation of the USDOS, um, uh, there, were, uh, there was cooperation between uh, the DOS and uh, uh, the uh, Iraqi uh, Civil Aviation Authority through CRDF. And then there came the pandemic and a lot of meetings were held uh, throughout the uh, uh, online through Zoom because it was impossible to have in-person meetings. And after that, uh, there was a revision of this uh, program in detail. And so it is the uh, uh, Iraqi civil uh, aviation security. And then uh, studying all uh, necessary security measures that may enhance uh, this uh, aviation security in Iraq. After those meetings, that uh, uh, necessary recommendations were developed uh, for Iraq, uh, for the uh, ICAA, and also for any competent agency in Iraq to follow up with any changes that may happen due to this program, and then lay the base course for the, this program in terms of the instructions and the regulations. As a matter of fact, the Iraqi government and also the ICA, after those recommendations and after this massive amount of information and the development of this program, they have met together with all security bodies in Iraq and um, uh, reviewed this uh, program extensively this year in October. And uh, the meeting was done throughout a full week. It was a condensed uh, meeting uh, to study, to conduct a study for the program by the ICEA. ICAA and uh, in cooperation with uh, all of the bodies uh, in uh, Iraq 
to study this uh, instrument uh, comprehensively. And uh, we hope uh, that this program in cooperation is implemented with the CRDF and the DOS. We hope that it is the cornerstone for uh, the stats and regulations uh, in Iraq so that it becomes, uh, as you said, the champion of this region. Thanks. Interesting perspective and, 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 and outlook on the impact of this project and what future does it hold you know, for the uh, country at large and, and for the region as well. So I think, you know, throughout today's discussion, we were able to kind of look at the general, uh, I would say, overview of aviation at large, its enablers, and also drawing from regional examples that highlight how we are all responsible for security. And it's not only a specific country or organization or group of um, agencies, it's, it's a collective and global effort. And it highlights the need for collaboration and, and uh, integration as much as possible. And we're also going to dedicate some minutes to answer some of the questions that we received uh, from the audience. Uh, we have Trisha Gillette. Uh, she has an answer and she says, does ICAO do random checks as mem at member countries to make sure they are complying with the regulations? John, I give it to you and Mr. Alvin. Yeah, thanks, Yazan. Uh, Trisha, uh, so the short answer is kind of, but the it's in, in terms of do they do checks of member countries? Yes, absolutely. Do they do random? The answer is no, because if you look at the eight critical elements and everything that's required, the advance notice and the coordination required to access a lot of these documents and spend a couple of weeks in a foreign country, having access to all the people, having access to all the documents, does not lend itself to being random. However, member states are encouraged to do their own internal auditing on an infrequent basis in preparation for a, an ICAO audit. So um, there's this sort of a, it's, it's a difficult, um, I, I guess, process to manage, but in terms of randomness, no, but audits, yes, uh, if that helps. Thanks a lot. And we have another question from Henry, and he says, I have traveled to Iraq for work in recent years on civil civilian airlines. It was a pleasant experience. What can other countries that have not seen the pressure and threats that Iraq has learn from Iraq's success in creating safe aviation for civilians? And Mr. Ali, I, I think this question could be greatly answered by you. So I would look forward to your answer to that question. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, ICAA and uh, all uh, security agencies in Iraq, uh, we endeavor uh, fully uh, to preserve and maintain sustainability and security throughout that country. As a matter of fact, the high sense of security of uh, uh, that the Iraqis have and their love uh, to live in general this um, develops or this puts the security criterion or standard at a very high level and uh, the security measures that are uh, at the airports uh, uh, currently at the highest level to stand up to and face any threat that may happen against the airports. So uh, if you uh, for international airports, if you're driving towards or if you're trying to go to the airports, you get uh, uh, to the lounge uh, directly. But in the Iraqi airports, there are, there are a lot of uh, strict uh, security measures to maintain and preserve uh, the uh, airports and certain uh, board, um, uh, limits in order to maintain and preserve uh, the properties and the workers and the staff. Point that you know, having a regional example and a regional champion like Iraq will also provide us with the umbrella and, and the understanding that we also need to tailor and adapt the um, standards to the local realities of that specific country into the local context. We cannot just take the standards that are applied at a specific international country or Western, Western country and just apply it to Iraq without considering the culture, without considering the local realities, without considering the economy and without considering the ge geography of the, the region at large. So I think by having 
An example with, in the effort that Iraq has undergone by refining its standards and tailoring it and customizing it to match its context, it will provide the region, the Middle East region at large and neighboring countries with an example of how the regional championship advocacy and advocacy of aviation security can be implemented anywhere in the globe, uh, provided that we adopt a regional approach and a contextual approach rather than just copying and pasting standards. Because from experience and from the lessons learned that we came across all across the, the you know, multiple projects that happen across the globe, having, you know, copying and pasting standards will not help you in, in leveraging your aviation security standards, but understanding your culture, understanding your threats and understanding your own realities and context will be the baseline for establishing a sustainable aviation security program. Um, I think that covered all of the questions that we have received so far. Once again, we thank our panelists and our speakers today, Mr. John and Mr. Ali, thank you very much for this very interesting and insightful discussion. We thank the attendees that have attended the uh, webinar. We're very happy that you have joined us today and we look forward that this serves as the baseline and as the cornerstone for the dialogue towards aviation security so that it becomes something that we always discuss and talk about globally and so that we, never, we can never ignore such very important and insightful topic that will leverage the security at large all across the globe. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot for all of our, for all of our attendees and we look forward to continuing this conversation in the future.